impact. We did talk to Granny for about 75 minutes, didn't we? Actually, it was only it was her normal length segment, if you can believe that. I don't. Your <laughs> equipment's malfunctioning. Hard to believe, but that was exactly 30 minutes. A busy 30 minutes. Yes, it, indeed. So, Impact. Short review. All the wrestling in the show was great. Everything else that was not a wrestling match was dumb. It opened with, uh, thankfully, a wrestling match. It was Jeff Hardy and Samoa Joe. Uh, the story here was that both guys... I believe both guys had a chance to be eliminated. As it turns out, neither one was. But Joe had a chance to, uh, with a win, he could have passed James Storm for first place in the Bound for Glory series. Jeff needed a win to clinch a spot in the finals, or at least the semifinals. So they had a very good match. Pay-per-view intensity. Big spot where Jeff hit a dive into Joe against the guardrail on the floor, which looked like it about killed both men. So he does a big comeback. He does the whisper in the wind, and he hits Joe's bad arm. And then he grabs Joe and basically a headlock takeover, and he scissors the bad arm, and Joe tapped out to Jeff Hardy's headlock. Cranking side headlock. Yeah. That was amazing. Did not see that coming. So this was fun. Thumbs up for impact. Very, very, very good match. Excellent match. The Bound for Glory series is uh, it's awesome. On the whole, yeah. Austin Aries had a meeting with Hulk Hogan. He demanded to know how the Aces and Apes were getting into the building every week. They pointed out that the guy who attacked Aries last week had apparently been on the TNA payroll the entire time. And he, now they knew he was part of this dirty gang. And so tonight, Austin Aries would get to interrogate this man. And Hogan ordered him to break both his legs. So for those of you that uh, listen to the Lance show, and Lance was speculating that perhaps... The guy whose mask fell off last week, as he was entering the ring, his mask accidentally fell off and he quickly put it back up. In fact, no, that was planned. This guy, when his mask came down, they were able to determine who he was and they went, my God, it's one of the grips. And apparently the grip was so stupid that he didn't bother watching a tape of the show, nor did he realize that his own mask fell off. So he just came to work this week. Yeah. They were waiting for him by the time clock, and when he punched in, they grabbed him, handcuffed him, and let him away. Let him away. I'm actually totally fine with this storyline. I can at least make sense of it in my head. That's all I ask. It does. It does require you to believe this man is dumber than anyone else in the company. Well, I was ready. I was fixing to hate it because I, I at first I thought that they knew who the guy was, and the guy knew that they knew who he was, and he still came to work anyway. Yeah. But that was not the case. So, I'm fine with this storyline. Hmm. So, uh, Christy tried to interview Joe. He had just lost his match to Jeff Hardy. Before Joe could say much, Magnus interrupted. Joe, my, this is a nitpick, I guess, but uh, Magnus a few weeks ago attacked Samoa Joe with a chair, injured his arm, and may have cost him a chance to win this tournament. So, then Magnus comes out to talk, and Joe just stands there peacefully. That was a little stupid. So, Magnus said they had been a good team, but then Joe had ruined it. He did not explain how Joe had ruined it. He wished Joe the best, and he walked away. And they... This is a subtle thing, but it's important. They gave Magnus time to walk away. They were standing on the ramp, and Magnus walked down the ramp that goes backstage. And they gave him nearly 10 seconds to walk away, and Joe watched to make sure he left. He was not being foolish. Then he turned around to answer Christie's question, and Magnus came charging back up the ramp, and he hit Samoa Joe in the back with a forearm as hard as he could. And... As soon as Joe hit the the steal, it was an old school TNA moment, and he went to the back. That's exactly what happened. I am uh, entertained by the fact that uh, Joe and Magnus are are feuding on television for Impact because they, of course, were a team and they broke up and everything like that. Meanwhile, in Japan, they are the GHC Tag Team Champions together right now. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> Had so there was the time of the stupid gimmick where there's a title shot and everyone argues about who should get it. They had a bunch of tag teams in there. It was uh, Robbie E and Robbie T, Kid Cash and Gunner, and Chavo and Hernandez. So they're all making their points. And AJ walks in. He wants a chance to fight the tag team chance by himself. And Hogan says, "No, you can't do that. And in fact, you are eliminated." <laughs> He eliminated him from the competition without ever actually considering him. 
AJ had to invite himself. I laughed. Tara met with Brooke Hogan. Brooke Hogan referred to Tess Mocker as Brooke repeatedly. So there are officially two Brooks in the company now. Yeah. Uh, Bro- Tara beat Tess Mocker last week, so Brooke, Brooke booked a rematch for the pay-per-view. Great. And then Galen and complained, so Brooke booked her against Tara tonight. And the two girls talked some very, very lame smack to each other. That part was kind of lame, but the segment was fine. Gail Kim versus Tara with Taryn Terrell as referee. <laughs> uh, God bless Tiffany. I have never seen a referee work so hard as Taryn Terrell. She works hard at everything she does. And I don't mean like, <laughs> let me rephrase that. No. Let me rephrase that. Everything is hard work for yes, her. Yes, there's a big difference. Yes. Everything she does is hard. It's amazing. When you see, I've seen thousands of wrestling matches in my life. I've refed a few of them. And I know that when the match starts, you make sure the opponents are in their separate corners, and then you ring for the, you call for the bell to be rung. That seems simple. For Taryn Terrell, Terrell, uh, Terrell? Because it rises hotter than hell. That's right, yes. Yeah, Taryn Terrell, Taren hotter Terrell. than hell. That's what they call her. Each step of this was a deliberate and specific motion that had to be carried out as a single act unto itself. Mm-hmm. So she points at Tara to get back into her corner, and she holds up a hand saying, Stop! Do not come out of this corner! Then she turns to Gail, and she points to the other neutral corner, and she holds up her hand saying, Stop! Don't come out of that corner! And only after the two combatants have been placed in the neutral corners, then she turned to the bell ringer. Then she took a higher posture to make sure the bell ringer could see her. Then she waved her arm high into the air. It was like a cheerleader doing an eye. It was, actually. You're right. Yes. A hand on the hip and everything. And then she waved her arm deliberately back and forth to make sure there was no confusion that she wanted the bell to be rung. Like a NASCAR race was starting. Yeah. The, 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 the amount of preparation. You know she was backstage practicing all this. Oh, of course. Over and over and over again. So, they, hey, she she was the ref. She's still not very good. If you can watch this match without watching Hotter Than Hell Taryn Terrell, the match was actually a hell of a match. Yes, it was. They had a very good match. But it was very difficult to watch the match because I was, I was fixated on Hotter Than Hell Taryn Terrell. My today in, uh, in this Segment also plugged K1 and Dave Batista. Yeah. Appearing on MMA Live. Yeah, the match was it was basic, but it was very, very good. And Tara made her comeback and she won with the Widow's Peak. Thumbs up. They recapped the Joey Ryan saga. The highlight of this is when he punched Al Snow in the face. The highlight of many things is when Al Snow gets punched in the face. And by the way, he punched him right in the face. Oh, yeah. He, he I can't believe they didn't the show face. that until... Maybe they've shown it before, but this is the first time I, I it noticed. It was months ago. They showed replay after replay after replay of him punching Al Snow right in the face. Yeah. So, uh... Al came down to the ring. Said he was inviting Ryan down for another chance. Ryan came through the crowd with a megaphone. He got zero reaction. Try to cut an indie geek promo. There's no tour into him as he was speaking. Problem with this is there are a few. Well, so obviously Joey Ryan is signed because they're doing the gut check gimmick again. Al Snow is giving him a second chance at gut check, and when Joey Ryan accepted, Al Snow said, "All right, you'll be fighting me in gut check," and Joey Ryan was very upset. But anyway. Leading up to this, Joey Ryan's doing his promo, and yes, it was an indie geek promo, and the problem was, I don't even really have a problem with that. You need all sorts of different people in wrestling, and Joey Ryan's character is unlike anything they have in TNA right now. He is different. But Al Snow blowing him off and rolling his eyes, and I don't know. It actually made it a thousand times worse to have Al Snow reacting like that. Yeah. 
Al Snow was reacting like this guy was the biggest geek, and it did nobody any favors. And on top of it, Ryan just kept going. So you got Joey Ryan playing Joey Ryan, talking about bringing Sleazy back, and Al Snow's trying to be a badass and trying to intimidate him and get him to shut up for just through being anger, angry. And really, they both came off looking bad. Yeah. So, Al, it gets worse. Well, I don't know if it gets worse. I presume it gets worse. It did not get better. Al uh, Al finally got mad because Joey Ryan was being annoying or whatever, and he slaps him hard across the face. And Ryan starts screaming, I'll sue! And he runs through the crowd screaming that he's going to file a lawsuit against Al Snow. And Al's in the ring, and, and now he's looking gravely concerned. And Taz is like, his temper got the best of him. And Al is scratching his chin, looking distressed. And I presume, <clears throat> I don't know this, but I presume that, like, this is how Joey Ryan gets his contract. He, he circumvents having the match with Al by filing a lawsuit, and so they hire him. And then I guess they they build further to this match later on down the road or so i don't know but anyway point i'm making here is if the idea of this storyline is that joey ryan is going to file a lawsuit because al snow slapped him when he was not under contract if that's the storyline here then it probably was not a very smart idea to show a video of joey ryan punching al snow right in the fucking face why doesn't al snow file a lawsuit would that not make sense? Yeah. In fact, if anything, Ryan cheap shot at Al Snow. Yeah. Well, not only that, but I mean, I, I, that was not the only thing that Joey Ryan did. I think he hit Al Snow like eight times, yeah. if I recall correctly. Disrupted the television show. Yeah. You know, so now, I, I don't know. We'll see what they do. But uh, not looking promising at this point. Well, as noted, everything on the show that was not a wrestling match was stupid. Now, the next segment was actually fine. Bully Ray confronted Joe Park Esquire. He was being very peaceful. He explained that they'd had the differences in the past. He understood that, but he knew that Hogan and Sting had hired Joe to investigate the Aces and Eights, and he wanted to know what Joe had learned. Joe said he was hired by Hogan and Sting, and attorney-client privilege stopped him from saying anything else. And Ray said, fine, and he walked out. I don't know what this accomplished, but it was fine. Mm. So security had that one Aces and Eights guy who was a cameraman or a grip or something. Mike from New York. I called him Mike. They handcuffed him. Handcuffed him. They took him into a small room. And that was uh, that was the tease. We were back to the tag teams arguing about who deserves who deserved a title shot. Chavo mentioned like absent mindedly. This would have been the first thing I would have said, but he, he said it like he almost forgot. By the way, we already beat Kid Cash and Gunner. That's an excellent point. Except in TNA. I can't say that in WWE. They would have said, so what? This guy's a better entertainer. So, eventually, they all shouted at each other, and Hogan eliminated Cash and Gunner because, this is a quote, it's too personal for you. What? Yeah. What's personal? I like when he says too personal for you and and uh and Cash said that makes a great feud or something like that. <laughs> he may I was have. like he's correct. <laughs> he may you have idiot. said that. I have no idea what personal issue Ka- Kid Cash and Gunner have with Kazarian and Daniels. And here's the point in my notes where I wrote this is a dumb fucking show. Had RVD versus Bully Ray Bound for Glory series match. The loser of this was out of the running. The winner was in the semifinals. Had a lot of time. Had a great story. All the momentum changes, all the all the transitions were big, impactful, meaningful moments. And finally, Rob does his comeback. He goes to the frog splash, but Ray pops up, catches him with a cutter, and gets the pin. Awesome. It's a good match. Well, by uh, current RVD standards, and a great finish. A great finish. I enjoyed this. Uh, Rob Van Dam is, uh, yeah, he's not as mobile as he used to be. That is true. But this was put together so well and paced so well that it really didn't matter. 
So we had our final four. James Storm was in first place, and he would get to choose his opponent. And the other three men in the tournament left are Samoa Joe, Bully Ray, and Jeff Hardy. Indeed. And something stupid happened. Stupider than anything else to this point in the show. Austin Aries is interrogating <laughs> the TNA employee who is handcuffed. On national television on live. national television. On live national TV. He wants to know who's in charge of the gang. Guy wouldn't talk. Aries slapped him a few times. Guy still wouldn't talk. So Austin Aries decided the proper thing to do here would be to use a pair of pliers to remove this man's tongue. Yeah. I'm not making this up. Well. I'm not exaggerating. Vinny, hmm. this is fine because Hulk Hogan earlier had told him to let him live unless Ace and Nate doesn't show up. I, that was later in this segment. What he said, I see. What he said earlier was that he wanted Aries to break both his legs. That's right. Break both the legs. Here's, well, beyond the issue of that you would try to remove a man's tongue with a pair of pliers on live national TV. The issue is that Aries was trying to get him to talk. If you tear his tongue out, he can't speak. It is a problem. He's a very bad torturer. So, before Aries could remove this man's tongue with a pair of pliers, Hogan cut him off and then threatened to remove one of the man's eyeballs. Yeah, he's going to jab his eye out with his thumb. Yeah. So at this point, the Aces and Eights leader called Hogan's cell phone. Let's think about this for a second. Yeah, he has his number. Well, that too, but... Which is probably a key to the storyline. It might be. Must be someone in TNA. He has Hulk's number. Yeah, so they... Uh, I wonder what came up on the speed dial. A and eight's leader. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't seem to recognize it, didn't he? Hmm. That's true. So, Hulk Hogan and his crew have kidnapped a man handcuffed him. Uh, they have mentally tortured him. They have physically struck him. They are prepared to physically torture him when the Aces and Ace leader calls in and is willing to negotiate for the release of his hostage. Yeah. And he's the bad guy? Well, uh, obviously, Mike from New York has some secrets. Or he's of value. So here was where Hogan ordered Aries to let him live. Let him live. Let him not die. Don't kill him. Do not murder this man during our TV show. Yes. So Storm came out to pick his opponent. Cut a great promo about how he had failed to win the title early in the year. Taking some time off. Come back stronger than ever. Run through the Bound for Glory field and come out on top. He called out Ray, Joe, and Hardy. He wasted no time. He picked Bully Ray. And he wanted Ray to come down to the ring so he could, he expl he could explain why face-to-face. He said Bully Ray had knocked him out of the tournament last year. He wanted to be the one to knock Ray out this year. And besides that, Ray had been accusing him of being affiliated with the Aces and Eights, and he wanted a, some punishment for that. So they had the two the two pairs of stare downs. Bully Ray versus James Storm and Samoa Joe versus Jeff Hardy. A rematch, in fact, of the opener on the show. And those are the, the two tournament matches with the uh, two winners meeting each other for Sunday. I have completely lost my place. Here we are. Chrissy tried to interview Rob Van Dam when Magnus interrupted. <laughs> yes, again. This is awesome. So Rob's cutting this promo, or excuse me, Magnus is cutting this promo about how Rob's had a devastating loss and uh, maybe time has passed him by. And as he's talking, Rob's looking off camera. <laughs> he's just kind of looking around the room, absentmindedly shrugging. And then at one point... I, I, don't, I wish I'd written down what Magnus had said. Magnus said something accusing Rob of weakness, and Rob responded by staring blankly, directly, <laughs> right into the camera. <laughs> so finally, Magnus outright said that Rob was washed up, and Rob punched him, and they had a little brawl. Yeah. This is funny. It was funny. We had uh, Kaz and Daniels versus Chavo Guerrero and Hernandez. Another good match. Hogan picked the challenge right before the show. I thought this was the best match in the show. Oh, no, the main of the, the opener was much better. Regardless, this was very good. Regardless, there was a but. In fact, every wrestling match in the show was really good. Yeah. Hernandez is very, very scary. 
sometimes in a bad way, sometimes in a like well, I'm in a bad way all the time. He's got Daniels like in a bear hug. And uh usually if you're gonna suplex someone from that position, you'll at least put them on the ground to even if they don't really push up, you can at least adjust your balance. No. Nope. He just suddenly horks Daniel straight up over his head into the into the ground. Absolutely terrifying. Even Taz was trying to break down the mechanics of the throw and how hard it was. So some uh, miscommunication with Chavo and Daniels, which is weird. But eventually, they got the heat on Chavo, cut him off, built with a hot tag forever. Hernandez came in, made his big comeback, ran wild, was big and strong and crazy and terrifying. He hit his big dive into both heels. He pulled it off fine. Crowd was going crazy. And then finally, he was about to hit the border toss on Kazarian, but Daniels clunked him with the uh, title belt, and Kazarian rolled him up and hooked the tights for the pin. So the babyface challengers looked great. The heel champions were devious, devious enough to escape with the belts. This is how pro wrestling is supposed to be done. This was just fun, fun, fun. Well... I do have to say one thing. First off, I didn't think the opener was better. But this is a very good match. But the thing to me was, they had a spot where the baby faces had the win, and Daniels broke it up by stopping the ref. He grabbed the ref and stopped him from counting. Yes. A, that should have been a DQ. But let's just ignore that for now. So then later, they do the belt shot gimmick finish, and the heels have now blatantly cheated twice to beat these baby faces that Hogan had chosen as the best bet to win the belts. So when this was over, and as noted, the baby faces got fucked after the heels had cheated twice, Hulk Hogan comes out, and instead of signing a rematch on the pay per view, which would be fair, he instead signs Daniels and Kazarian against AJ who, in fact, he had eliminated first earlier tonight, and his partner, Kurt Angle, who wasn't even on this show because he's hurt. That was wacky. I, I, will, I will rebut both your points. Uh, the fact that Daniels stopped the count by putting his hands all over the referee, yes, that should have been a DQ, but I see it all the time, and I'm just numb to it now. We see refs get yanked out of the ring all the time. It, it's just It is how wrestling works now. As to the other point, I, I see your point as to why Hogan would want to give his team another chance after they had been screwed out of their fair chance, but damn it, Hulk Hogan is my hero for this. He said, it's not fair, but the fact is this team lost, and since they lost, they do not get another shot because God damn it, there are ramifications when you win and when you lose. I will accept that. All right. Besides, uh, they can always now say they can build up to a rematch. They can beat Gunner and Cash again, or they can beat Robbie E and Robbie T, and then just say, "Hey, we we've earned our shot now." And then this time, and this time, we're gonna get you fuckers. So we have the main event angle. Aries brought the kidnapped man down to the ring. Let me say one thing, real quick. I will rebut your rebuttal. All right, I'm fine with that because I do think it's important to have wins and losses matter. But with that said, um, in a real sport, in a UFC fight, for example, or a football game, you know, well, maybe not a football game, but in a UFC I fight, say. I know this would happen. You know, and this has happened before. Let's say that you, uh, a fight is a draw, but one of the judges fucked up his addition, and he ends up giving a round to the other guy. And so one guy wins due to a, an addition error, and they discover it later. Uh, they do a rematch because a guy got fucked, you know? And this was like a blatant fucking. This wasn't just like the heels cheated, but like the baby faces had the win and the heels cheated. And then the heels cheated again, so they got double fucked. So I think they deserved a rematch, personally. Although, to be honest, the other match is probably going to be better. <laughs> that's a good point too actually but yeah no you're, you're right in that it, we have seen in UFC or situations like that have led to a rematch in, in in football and pretty much other sports pretty much all of the sports teams lose on bad calls all the time and it's just sorry that's life so we had the main event angle Aries brought the kidnapped man down to the ring 
He wanted the man who broke his arm two weeks ago, only they didn't know his name, so they just referred to him as the arm breaker over and over again. So the deal was when the the leader uh, tried to negotiate earlier, he was willing to exchange the arm breaker for this Mike person. So Ares comes out with Mike, and the arm breaker does not show up. And so finally Ares begins to threaten Mike more, and Mike is about to speak. When the arm breaker arrives... Mike Moore? Was that his last name? I... Uh, no. Oh, Mike Moore. Moore. I see. Yeah. As in more than he Further. had before. Further. In addition to... I'm thirsty. I thought they were beating up <laughs> Michael Moore. I was baffled. That would have been ratings. <laughs> so, the hostage was about to speak. When the arm breaker arrived, he grabbed Mike... Dragged him out of the ring, and then bunked him in the head with a hammer. And Ares and the Armbreaker brawled, and they were still brawling as the show went off the air. So I guess they booked a fight between Ares and the Armbreaker. It was a weird anticlimactic finish. They did book that. Yeah. It's just a fight. You know who does an Armbreaker finisher? Alberto De Rio. Robert Roode. Oh, yeah. Bobby Roode uses the Fujiwara Armbar. He is an Armbreaker. Yep, yep. Here's my only, uh, this, listen, last week I was so sick of Aces and Eights, but uh, they did move the storyline forward yes. dramatically this week. Something happened this week. Great. It was stupid, but it happened. Here's the problem. So, what I thought was going to happen was that Ares would offer to put the title on the line against one of Aces and Eights, and of course, some hijinks would occur. And uh, Bobby Roode, under a mask, would pin Aries and win the title, unmask. He's the champion. He circumvented his uh, no rematch clause. James Storm wins, and you've got Storm and Roode with four weeks build or whatever for Bound for Glory. But, Pierce are not doing that. So, they're having a fight on Sunday, which presumably means a non-title match. So, if on Sunday... It is revealed that Bobby Roode is the man behind Aces and Eights. And they decide to go from Sunday, and they got to somehow get the title on Roode off Aries, and then do the build to James Storm. This ain't going to work. I mean, maybe there's uh, some genius here that I'm missing. Maybe they uh, have this this grand plan worked out perfectly, and it's actually going to be awesome. But it's... To me... Everything is muddled right now. Where is Bobby Roode? Don't know. He's vanished. He he walked away on television. He has not been seen since. I I mean, at this point, I'm pretty much certain he's the man behind aces and eights. But the whole idea was you're building towards James Storm getting his big win over Bobby Roode for the title. Okay. How many weeks left do we have until Bound for Glory? When's Bound for Glory? October win? I don't know. Let's find out. Live radio, everyone. Bound for Glory 2012 is uh, October 14th, and uh, the pay-per-view is the 10th. Uh, I'm sorry, the 9th. So they've got one, two, three, four, basically four weeks of television left between the pay-per-view and Bound for Glory. So somehow, if the plan is still James Storm versus Bobby Roode, Somehow, between Sunday and Bound for Glory, in four weeks, with four television shows, you're somehow now going to get the title on Bobby Roode, and obviously, the Aries storyline, one would presume, would need to be wrapped up, you know? Let's just say that Bobby Roode wins the title on Sunday, somehow, by hook or crook, or on Thursday, Okay. To me, you can't just go right to James Storm, even though he's the number one contender. What about Ares? What about Ares, who's been screwed right and left and is about to be screwed out of his title? Doesn't that have to kind of be wrapped up? So then you've got to put the title on Rude, wrap up the Ares thing, and somehow make Rude versus Storm for the title seem meaningful. And you've got four weeks. So I don't know if they're just not doing Storm versus Rude. Maybe, I don't know. To, in order to re-sign, Bully Ray agreed to uh, re-sign if he got the title shot in the belt, and they're actually going to do, you know, 
I don't know, Aries and uh, and Bully Ray at the pay-per-view. I don't know what they're going to do, but it seems to me that they can't possibly be doing Rude versus Storm because it's just, to me, it can't work. I just don't think it can work. I don't know what else they'll do. Four guys left. Who can win, Vinny? Who can defend the title at, uh, or who can fight for the title at Bound for Glory? You can do Storm versus Rude? Or Storm versus Ares? They can't. If they have Storm fail again, he's dead forever. <laughs> he has he has to win the tournament. So that would so, mean he would be uh, facing Ares unless Ares loses the title. But again, if Ares loses the title, one would think you'd have to wrap that up before you move on. But no, there's not enough time. You've got to go, 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 go for the next four weeks. It just seems way too muddled for me. Uh-huh. And uh, I guess we'll see what they do. Maybe they've got some brilliance planned that I cannot conceive of in my diminutive mind. Yeah, no, I agree. It's it's the Aces and Eights thing. I just honestly, it feels like it's gotten lamer and more repetitive and more watered down every week. This week, as noted, at least something happened. But it's been the focus of the company for realistically probably two or three months. It feels like much more than that. And uh, I don't think anyone cares about it. We shall see, everybody. I thought it was a very good impact, very good show, but uh, terrible comparison here. But I remember in March of 1998 when WCW had just done a string of house show sellouts, and I knew they were fucked. I'm not saying that TNA is fucked. I'm just saying that they've had two great weeks of television, but to me... I don't know how they're going to make the next four weeks leading into Bound for Glory work. I just don't know how they're going to do it. But we'll see. We shall see. So anyway, that's the show for today, everybody. To the back! Are we going to now call the Vinny and Brian show? Because I'm not going to stand for that. All right. Unlike Kane, I don't care about how you build a show. So just, see, they need to work on their pairing better. Just just pay me. Uh, if you pay me Kane's salary, that would be awesome. Don't hold your breath. All right. TNA's pay-per-view... Open with Samoa Joe and Jeff Hardy. It was all right. It was not as good as their match on uh, Impact. Uh, Joe, they started teasing finishers, and then uh, Jeff hooked Joe in the same headlock slash armbar thing that he used to win the match on Impact, and Joe turned that into a cradle, and Jeff turned that into his own cradle, and and he won. Uh, finish came out of nowhere. Kind of felt like they were just starting, just getting started. And uh, my f- favorite part of this actually was Joe's reaction to the whole, th- to the whole thing. Because he was, first he was shocked. And then he was disappointed because, god damn it, he was, he was finished. Nothing he could do now. He was out of the running. And he went to go and he just gave Jeff a thumbs up. And he left. He had Borash interviewing James Storm. He said he had beaten... Said Bully Ray had beaten him in the semifinals last year. Tonight he would right that wrong and move on to the finals, and then he would face Jeff Hardy, and he noted that Hardy had beaten him in this very tournament, but he vowed to beat him too. We then had the low point on the show. James Storm versus Bully Ray. Like everything was done badly here. They had a bad match. They had bad booking. And then the wrong man went over. Mostly that last part. The match was boring. They weren't a house show match here on pay-per-view with lots of stalling. I cannot believe, honestly, that these two men were working so lazily on the show. They were, they, they, they were I can't even say half-assing it. They were quarter-assing it. Then there was a parade of ref bumps. A lot of them. Over and over and over. And then Bobby Roode ran down, and he broke a beer bottle over James Storm's head. And he put Billy, Bully Ray on top, and... The ref counted three, and James Storm was out of the tournament. And if you've been watching this show for the past season, really, all, all summer, they told you one story, they, they they had a beginning, they had a middle, they were about to have the re- resolution, and then they gave you... I can't even say they gave you a different ending of the story. It was like you were watching a movie on television, and uh, just before the movie ended, you switched to a different movie and saw that ending instead. So isn't that like every TNA angle over the last ten years, basically? Yeah. Except they will change the channel several times throughout the movie. <laughs> this year they waited until the end. Mm. I had I watched this show tonight. I watched the show like uh, uh, five p.m. 
local time. So I had 48 hours notice that this segment had gone down. And when I went back and watched it, well, I can't, when, I, when I watched it, I was still just in awe of how bad it all was. Everything about this was terrible. Yep, it sucked. We had Borash interviewing Tess Mocker. She credited Tara for teaching her everything she knew. Then we had the match, Tara versus Tess Mocker with... No wonder Tara wanted to kick her ass. <laughs> Badoomsh. We had Tara versus Tess Mocker with the one and only Taryn Terrell as the referee. Mm-hmm. She's a constant form of entertainment. Oh, yeah. You always, she always knows... She, has, she knows that she's supposed to be doing something. But she has no idea what that something is, ever. So she's just moving. She'll put her weight on her left foot. She'll she her, never stands still. She that is a her, fact. She'll put her weight on her right foot. She will step forward. She will step back. She will bend over. She will stand up. She's just fidgeting constantly. She's like the anti-referee in the sense that... Yes. You're, you're supposed to not know the referee's there. <laughs> right. And you can't even... like When, when, when she's refereeing... Like, you're unaware that there are two other wrestlers in the ring. Yes. <laughs> and, I mean, she's hot, but it's not like she's the hottest girl in the world. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So it's not like, oh, my God, I, I cannot. I mean, really, you know, you're distracted by Brooke, who's. She's hotter. But, I mean, it's just like she's hilarious. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's an amazing mix of, of uh, beauty and hilarity that is, that is uh, captivating. It's the best I can I can describe our our friend Tiffany. I gotta go back actually. I interviewed her several years ago and uh I have no memory of it. I can only imagine what it must have been like. But uh it's in the archives somewhere. If anybody wants to uh go in there and find it. I should listen back to that. You know what? I'm gonna find it. Keep going. So there was a match going on. The story was it was all clean wrestling early. And Brooke left the ring at one point and Tara hold, held the ropes open so Brooke could get in, and Tara let her in, but then as soon as Brooke climbed in, Tara immediately schoolgirled her, schoolgirled her, Jesus Christ, schoolgirled her, and tried to win the match. Uh, that pissed Tessmacher off, and then suddenly they were having a wrestling match. Tara got a superplex, which is the move they pointed out that won her the match on impact, and then she tried the Widow's Peak, and Brooke turned that into a sense of flip for the win. They shook hands. Tara was still pissed. Was a match. But uh, even raising the winner's hand for Taryn is an accomplishment. Oh, my God. It's a goal to be achieved. Oh, my God. This is from uh, October 5 of 2007. It is a joint show with Taryn Terrell... And Les Thatcher. (laughs) Not making this up, everybody. Gonna play some of this here in a little while. In fact, let's let's listen to a little bit now. I'm sure the audio is uh, phenomenal. Oh, it's back when I had entrance music on Figure Four Daily. When did you get into wrestling? I mean, was this something where had the diva search never come about, you probably would not have ever tried out, like, gone to a wrestling school or anything like that? Or was it always in the back of your mind that maybe someday I'd like to do this? Well, I've been in school, and that was my my main focus. And throughout high school and college, uh, I participated in powerlifting and cheerleading. So, you know, that was definitely, you know, my main focus. We didn't have a wrestling uh, team in school, or else I would have been a part of it. I was always, you know, the one that wanted to be a part of the sports that was male-dominated. I tried to play football at my school, but I went to a Catholic high school, and they refused to let girls play on the team. Thanks a lot. So, you know, I was always that type of person. Um, But, yeah, I mean, I I definitely would have, if there would have been an opportunity, you know, to to do it, I would have. And I would have gone out for past diva searches, but... Like I said, I was focusing on, on getting my education first and then figuring out, you know, what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to be in sports. I knew I wanted to be in, you know, sports entertainment or sports, sports marketing um, in any type of facet. So if I could be a wrestler, then, yes, I want to be a wrestler. And if, you know, I if I have a million walls that tell me no, I'm going to break them down and, and find a way to do it. Those speaking walls. <laughs> okay, let's go on. That was less exciting than I had anticipated. 
I want to know what her education's all about. No actually. wonder I. I, I didn't I'm intrigued it. by the education of Tiffany. Well, maybe she'll talk about it. Let, let's 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 listen to one more question. See if she addresses her education. Ue. You know, I'm pretty much devoted to WWE. You know, I've tried to turn it on to, to TNA every once in a while, and you Uh-oh. know, watch Kurt Angle, and you know, I know Christy Hemme's over there, and but you know, to be honest, I just I really really like WWE. <laughs> the shows are the shows are you know so much better. <laughs> You'll fit right in here then, because uh oh, TNA is I don't know. We won't we won't get into that here, but uh, <laughs> I, I did see some pictures of you training. Uh-huh. And in Playboy, it looked oh. like you were doing some MMA stuff. Yeah, we're doing um, flying arm bars and those pictures and, and hip tosses. And, and where was this at? Because this wasn't like a WWE ring. No, no, we were uh, at a, a local place in in uh, New Orleans, just kind of hanging out. And a friend of mine fights. He's just signed a three fight deal with Elite XC. Uh, Lucky so he, him. You know, he's like a, he's <laughs> so obviously he you know, one of the best fighters and no holds bar and Who is this? And jiu-jitsu. What was his name? Uh, J.C. Pennington. Okay, cool. A stellar career yeah, he's so, had since 2007. You know, we're, we've been training him. He's you know he knows wrestling and and so we've just been he's been teaching me some stuff and we've been just you know yeah we're in a boxing ring so of course you know the it's not as as cushiony or springy <laughs> as uh, a wrestling ring would be but. You know, but it's good to be able to get in there and to start learning some things, learning the basics, because, you know, my goal is to be able to go to, you know, training, you know, go to OVW or, you know, go down to Tampa. So I want to be able to, if I have that opportunity, I want to be able to go in with the basics and for people to know that I'm here, you know, I want to learn this and I want to become professional and I want to become great. I don't want to just be a wrestler. I want to be a great wrestler. J.C. Pennington here apparently, uh... Not on a uh, four losses in a row and then a win. He's still fighting. He's still fighting. I have an idea. Let me see how many Elite XC fights he got. I have an idea. Yes? You and I will stop watching wrestling. We will just break out old shows and make fun of them. (laughs) Yeah. Mystery uh, Science Figure 4 Daily, 8,000. In audio, yes. It looks like he got uh, one of his fights on his uh, three-fight deal. Actually, no, that's Show XC, so he got zero of his Elite XC fights, it looks like. Bummer. Uh, poor bastard. All right, let's let's uh, let's continue on here. So, uh, security was taking Rude out of the building. Hogan walked up and told him he would rot in jail. Storm attacked, and they took him away, too. It was time for the fight. He had scheduled a time for this not-match. Austin Aries versus the Arm Breaker. So Ares comes out. He said he was ready for war because he was the god of war. Wrong Ares. But anyway. Stood in the ring for a while waiting for somebody to come out. I was still pissed off because of that uh, James Storm match. And I thought this is pay-per-view. This is pay-per-view. And Ace is an Ace guy comes out and he stands there for a while. I just kept thinking I'm paying for this fight. Finally, the fight started. Once the fight started, it was pretty fun. Ares has an amazing ability for a very small man to carry himself like he's going to kill you. He is an excellent badass. Uh, This is different than like Rey Mysterio, who carries himself like I'm going to use speed and agility to uh, surprise you and pin you in a sporting event. Ares was carrying himself here like I am going to kill the fuck out of you. And he did. I got to have... I got to... I got to... I actually agree with you uh, uh, 95%. Okay. But I do have a complaint about Austin Aries. He's got to stop skipping. <laughs> Every now and then, when he starts a comeback, uh-huh. he'll skip. He, he does like to jump. Like, he does a wacky little like a little jump, like a little leprechaun. I, I, know, little, I know exactly what you mean. A little hop skip to get yeah. up to the top rope. And it's like, it kills it for me right there. Because I believe that Austin Aries, I've said this about guys, I, I mentioned this actually for those of you that haven't heard the uh, Conan show yet. It's up on the front page. Conan interviewing me. How surreal is that? But uh, Was that, by the way, real quick, was that his idea or yours? Uh, well, he does a, a podcast. All right, then. Uh, him and uh, Mr. St. Laurent and Court Bauer here and there, and they asked me to be on, and I had a great time, and apparently he's going to uh, do a book review of uh, Death of WCW at some point. So That will be awesome. I can't wait. But anyway, i got to send him the book. That's the catch. Ah. So uh, anyway, bastard. the uh, the point of it is we were talking about small guys and and uh, 
my theory on small guys is in many cases the idea that small guy can't be top guy in many cases i hate to say it it's true okay because you have to convince the fans that you're the best and it's easy to do that when you're the biggest i know that i sound like vince mcmahon but uh you know it's kind of a fact (laughs) you can kind of go back to the beginning of time the guy you don't mess with is the biggest one okay so it's a lot easier if you're big to convince the audience that you're the best so in order for a small guy to be on top unlike vince i believe that you can put a small guy on top but you got to be really good to be the small guy who can be on top and uh and kurt angle is a is a great example uh there's uh, the famous story of, I can't remember who it was, uh, Hunter was at one point apparently uh, uh, bitching about Kurt, you know, he can't be champion, he's too small, this and that, and, uh, and somebody just said, why don't you go try him? Yeah. They're putting into that. So, I mean, if you, if you and, and obviously Angle, you know, he could kill most of the people in the locker room, but if you are a small guy and you can convince people that you're the best, then great. Make that guy the champ. And uh, Austin Aries, to me, he does a great job being a believable guy that you believe, even though he's so small, this guy could kick your ass. And a lot of small guys, I mean, uh, uh, for those of you that didn't hear the show and for those of you that did, get ready for this again. Miz! When they put the title on Miz, it was like, was there really anybody that believed for a second that Miz could kick anybody's ass? I mean, no. <laughs> That's just a fact. Maybe, here's another thing. Maybe Miz could kick everyone's ass. Maybe Miz is the toughest guy in the locker room. But guess what? I don't believe it when I watch him on television. So, point of this is, uh, Aries is very good at projecting uh, this era uh, this, this, this era of, I'd, I'd beat your ass. But, whenever he starts to skip, Kills it for me every time. Every time it kills it for me. So if he could just take that out of his arsenal, the skipping, the jumping, I think he'd be significantly more effective. So they're having this fight, and it goes, I don't know, five or six minutes. And Aries used uh, powder to the eyes, used a roll of coins. He hit the giant man with a brain buster, and he threatened to take, a, take the man's mask off, and the rest of the gang attacked. TNA locker room emptied. They had a big brawl. And uh, somewhere in here, actually, they showed it on a replay. Uh, one of the Aces and Nates guys threw Jeff Hardy's shoulder first into the ring post. So he was hurt. And uh, they cleared the ring. Hogan was screaming at security to lock all the doors. Blatant fire hazard. And uh, Bully Ray was out there, and he was being Mr. Team Player and Mr. Boy Scout. Mm-hmm. He's very concerned for Jeff Hardy's condition. He offered a knuckle bump to Aries, showing respect for the battle he had just been in. I didn't really know how to rate this because it wasn't a match, just a fight and then an angle, but I enjoyed it. Sure. We had the Sanjay Dutt Zima, Zima Ion uh, video package and then match. Mm-hmm. Do they do anything? And I mean anything? No, match? nothing. Okay. Absolutely nothing. Just, just the sure. angle weeks back where uh, where uh, uh, Dutt was too hurt, so Hogan eliminated him. Mm. Now he's healed, so I guess he gets a chance. All right. So they had a match. They did... A bunch of cool moves, and then it very quickly became they have done too many. They have done too many cool moves. I don't remember any of them. Uh, everything they did looked good. It was just they did so much stuff you couldn't. It, I, the crowd uh, totally fell asleep at one point, and they did a, a million roll-ups and submissions. Finally, Zima won with a gory bomb. Like I say, they worked really hard, and everything looked good, but there was nothing memorable about it. In the middle of this, by the way, the uh, cops arrived backstage with the lights flashing. So after the match, Hogan is meeting with the police, and he's giving them instructions and orders. Hulk Hogan, apparently now the sheriff of Orlando, giving instructions to his men. Including arrest and beat. Yeah, beat! He, he, was, he was ordering them to commit 
ordering them to commit p- police brutality many times. Yeah. Borash was uh, with the trainers looking at Jeff's, Jeff's shoulder. Magnus arrived and he got What are you like, doing over there, by the way? My voice or the twisting? The twisting. I'm twisting in the chair. Okay, don't do that because it's very loud. That? Yeah, I can hear it in my headphones, right. so everyone else can as well. They're yeah, fine. And Magnus cut a promo on RVD. So, uh, <laughs> Magnus and Rob Van Dam had a match. And Rob won with a frog splash. And I had, like, I had written down nothing up to that point. So I just, in my notes here, I basically apologized for uh, writing such a horrible review. But I was just, I was burned out on the show already. And I felt bad. And I went to check uh, what Dave had wrote in his online report. And Dave's report was one-third the length of what I wrote. <laughs> they had a match, everyone. Rob Van Dam won. Let's move on. Borash interviewed Kazarian and Daniels. The best team in the world. Kaz was so angry about his fate in life, he had to invent words. They were counting down the crimes that had been committed against them by this company. And... uh it was just a great promo. I can't. I couldn't do it justice in my notes. I can't. Can't do it justice now. This team needs to be a major part of every show until the end of time. Ideally, feuding with the team they faced, faced uh, on the show. Yeah. Daniels and Kazarian versus Angle and Styles had a really, really, really good match. Most notable here is that Kurt Angle had a bad hamstring, and his leg was all taped up, and he was still the best guy in the match, even though the other three guys are really good. They got the heat on. Uh, Got the heat on AJ for a while. Kurt got a great hot tag. Came in, suplexed the hell out of everyone. Actually, this is earlier, but I had to point it out. AJ and uh, AJ and St- AJ and Kurt, yes, AJ Styles and Kurt Angle, they teamed together and they gave Kazarian a double backdrop, and they threw him high into the heavens. And Kazarian came down like uh, he burnt up on re-entry like a meteor meteorite, mm-hmm. and he hit the mat with a massive thud, and he cried out. And Kurt threw him so high and saw this man land that he could not help but just start to laugh. <laughs> he went very high. He went really goddamn high. So, yeah, so so later Kurt gets his hot tag, and he's suplexing guys around, and then AJ got a second hot tag that wasn't nearly as hot, and so Kurt came in to kick more ass again. And finally, Kurt hits a cactus clothesline on Daniels, Takes them both out of the ring. He screams. He swears. He grabs his leg. The ref goes to tend to him. So the ref's out of the picture. And then AJ tries a Styles Clash on Kazarian. But Daniels threw his apple teeny in AJ's face. Kaz schoolboyed him for the win. It's went a little long. They, they could have chopped some of the middle part of it out. But just a really, really fun match. And like I say, I want them to feud on every show. I do love all of these men. They're awesome. Yeah. We had Hogan giving the cops more instructions. I think here is where he told them to break uh, to break the guy's legs. That's right. Something like that. No, that was actually... Uh, I don't know if he said break their legs on this show. I know he did an impact. He was impact. On the impact show. was when he wanted uh, Austin Aries, shooter, oh, maybe that's it. to uh, break their legs. Yeah. Borash interviewed Bully Ray. Ray said he was going to win this tournament no matter what happened uh, with the Aces and Eights. Said we had to respect him for reinventing himself over the past year and a half. That's true. That is definitely true. He said he was not just bound for glory, he was destined for greatness. All the fans applauded. And I watched this promo and just thought, when this man got his break when he started, his gimmick was that he was a stutterer. Mm -hmm. His gimmick was that he could not talk. Now he's awesome. My whole problem with this whole show, one of them, I had many of them, actually. Oh, quite a few. My biggest problem was that, uh, is Bully Ray a babyface? By the end of the show, he was. Yeah, and I don't think that's the idea. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he's turning babyface. But, uh, he, he was a be- fighting babyface on this show. Uh-huh. And there was that part of me that was like, okay, you know, he's behind Aces and Eights. And, uh, he's the one that had Jeff, uh, send her to the post. That's why he was there. That's why he's being so... He really, honest to God, just wants to uh, cheat his way into the finals at Bound for Glory in the title shot. But, uh, you know, he was a fighting babyface the whole time. Yeah. So... There was no payoff to this. 
This is a case where they should have done a swerve. Or well, maybe that is going to be the swerve on Thursday, as it turns out, oh my god, he was behind it the whole time. If that's the case, then it's a bad swerve for him, because he still ended up losing. So, for, And it took heat off Jeff. And it took heat off Jeff. So, yeah, for, for the third or fourth time on this show, we had a lot of stalling going on. Again, pay-per-view. Jeff didn't come out for a long time. Hogan finally came out. He took a long time to explain that Ray could win by forfeit now, or he could fight like a man on Thursday. And Ray protested, and then he gave the mic back to Hogan, and finally Jeff limps down, and his shoulder's all taped up, he can barely walk. And they bump knuckles, and they had this match, and it's the main event of this main event of the pay-per-view, the finals of this tournament that's going on all summer, and they had no heat. And no one cared. And I, all I could think was, well... Maybe if you hadn't pulled the rug out from under the guy that you told us was going to win, maybe people would be into it then. So Jeff Hardy, who is a fantastic babyface, who is loved wherever he goes, he starts his fiery one-armed comeback, and they still didn't care. And then they started kicking out of finishers. They kicked out of sentons. They kicked out of twist of fates. They kicked out of bubba bombs. They kicked out of bubba cutters. It got funny after a while. And then finally... Jeff knocked him off the top rope, followed with a senton, and just pinned him. So, yes, after all that, Jeff Hardy won the Bound for Glory series. So, apparently, it's going to be Jeff Hardy versus Austin Aries at Bound for Glory. That appears to be the plan. Wow. Yeah, no real uh, surprise about what happened uh, as far as the heat and the lack thereof. And I I guess we'll see what they do with uh, James Storm. But, man, I don't know. To give the guy a 20-point... Listen, the guy failed at lockdown, and then he got a 20-point head start, and he still failed in a Bound for Glory tournament. You know what I mean? Well, like, turn you, Bully I, Ray, I, I do. That detail is kind of relevant, but... And turn James Storm heel, and then maybe this will be fine, because how do you get behind James Storm at this point? I don't know. I mean, now I can just imagine. It's like they try and push him on Thursday, and nobody cares. They're like, ah, this damn guy can't get over. That's like a WWE thing right there. Oh, man. We tried with the guy, but hey, he won't get over. Yeah, he failed twice, monumentally. So, hello? Of course he's not going to get over. Anyway. That was the show, everybody. That was, uh... No Surrender. Pretty good, huh? Yeah. Let's, uh... To the back! Anyway, we've talked a long time about stuff. Let's do impact and uh, wrap this up. I'll try to get through this in about 10 minutes. Aries came out to open the show with a promo. Celebrated the beating he gave the Aces and Nates guy at the pay-per-view. Called out Jeff. Congratulated him on his win. Said, you want my belt, but there's something I want from you. But before he could speak anymore, Bully Ray came out. Bully Ray was a baby... Did we ever find out what he wanted from him? No. Hmm. Bully Ray was a baby face of the pay-per-view, and now he is not. I think he was supposed to be healed the pay-per-view... But they were doing this subtle deal where he was trying to, to subtly kind of fuck his way into the main event at Bound for Glory. But unfortunately, it was so subtle that everyone in the building thought he was a baby face. And it uh, it took the heat off the main event more so than already been taken off. And so I think they just figured, we need to go full bore heel with this guy yes. again. Because these people aren't getting it. Yeah. Kind of like with CM Punk, actually. Yeah. So here he was a complete heel. He said uh, Aries was lucky that he was not facing Bully. He said Jeff was lucky because Bully had taken an easy on him. And he... Uh, oh, that's right. They they were talking, and Bully Ray backed down, and then his music played, and then Tanae said the match was official. Yeah. And we said, what? What happened? And Jeff Hardy looked annoyed. Somebody hit their uh, cue too early. Yeah. I believe the music guy screwed up the whole thing. We had Sanjay Dutt versus Zima Ion. This was a 15-minute match on Fast Forward. They did 7,000 moves. The fans were way more into it than they were the pay-per-view match. Sure. Sanjay hit three dives literally in the first minute. So, he hit his moonsault foot stomp of certain death. Zima got a foot in the ropes. So, Sanjay went up top again, and Zima knocked him down and cradled him for the pin. And he attacked him after the match and put him in an armbar. We had the great team of Chris Daniels and Frankie Gazarian. They were goofing around in Hogan's office. Frankie was wearing a Hulkamania t-shirt and he bleated an attempt to suck up. 
It failed. And Hulk said they were doing singles matches tonight. He said Daniels would face Chavo or Hernandez. And Kazarian would face AJ or Kurt. He did not mention how these matches would be finalized, but that's what would happen. And uh, if either one of them lost, they would have to give a rematch to that team. If they both won, then no more rematches, which begs the question, what are you ever going to do with the tag team titles again? That was my question. It was like, I realize there's a better tag team scene in TNA than WWE, but if you've got two teams and both teams get no more rematches, slim pickings on the tag matches in the future. That's true. For the champions. That's true. You're speaking of... Your cats are having a fit out there. Well, she's uh, she's getting their food ready, so they're outside the door flipping out. Hmm. You know, it's funny. <laughs> I don't know. It's like the little one now. The little one, because the little one's a baby. This is uh, the, the cat that Vinny just adopted uh, is the mother of this new baby we've got in here. And, like, the cats have been here forever, so Snorky's been here the longest. So when it's time for dinner, she knows exactly what that means, and she'll run up the stairs, but then she's just, like, relaxed because she knows the door is going to open. Whereas the little one, I don't think it's figured out yet that when you shut the door, eventually the door is going to open and there's going to be food there because you shut that door and it's absolute panic while the food is being prepared inside the room. Because you can't prepare the food with the cats there. It's just, it's impossible. You've got to lock them outside the room, get the food ready, open the door, and they all dash in. in complete insanity. How often do you feed your cats? Uh, they get fed in the morning and at night. Hmm. Yeah. We don't leave food out for them. Are your cats been doing a fitness model sometime? Well, no, but they're healthier. I see. Yeah. Do our cats look unhealthy? They look... <laughs> Fit? Hungry. They look hungry. Well, of course they're hungry at night. And they're hungry in the morning. They're fine the rest of the day. Until nighttime comes again. AJ and Kurt had a discussion. Kurt uh, allowed AJ to be the one to wrestle uh, Kazarian, but he wanted AJ to guarantee a win, and AJ did. Then Wes Briscoe arrived. I love how Wes Briscoe and Kurt Angle are best friends. Yeah. For no reason. Strip club connoisseurs. I guess. That was it. We never saw either one of them again. Then perhaps they went to a club. Bobby Roode came out for a promo. He said nothing of value. Storm interrupted. They had a brawl. It went backstage. Now the building. Frankie Gazarian versus... Uh, I wrote Angle. It's AJ. I got that one wrong. Frankie Gazarian versus AJ Styles. They were on the apron. And AJ tried a suplex or something. And I don't know what happened, but I think Kaz hit his head on the apron and the floor. I think AJ was trying to give him a DDT on the apron, and Kazarian didn't know what he was supposed to be taking. That could be, too. It's very awkward. I'm fairly certain it did not go how they had planned it. No. So it settled into a good TV match, and uh, AJ won clean with a Styles Clash. He guaranteed something and delivered, and uh, his team gets a rematch now. I wonder if AJ was trying to like give him a DDT on the apron... And he thought that Kazarian was going to take a flat bump, but Kazarian decided he was going to take a, a rolling or a kind of a flip bump, mm -hmm. and then he missed the apron. <laughs> I don't know what happened. And then they showed a replay like, take a look at this. These guys were trying to kill themselves in this match. That was what I... That's er, early on, yes. They, they, there was a couple of spots where they... they well, there's even AJ taking the, the his monkey flip spot where he does a high, wacky, flailing monkey flip onto the mats outside. It's like, you're a crazy man. Yeah. For what? I have no idea. Hulk was backstage giving his daughter a lecture about safety. Trying to tell her where she could go and had to be escorted everywhere. He, she, he said he wanted her to be followed by two people at all times. To which he replied, where am I going to find two people? That's what she said. Where am I going to find two people? Are you on the moon? <laughs> the bottom of the sea. <laughs> That so, was not her dumbest line on the show, by the way. So, Joe Park Esquire arrived. The admirable Joe Park Esquire. He was awesome. So he always. explained to Hogan that he'd been on the case. He had learned some uh, good data on the Aces and Eights, but he couldn't prove anything yet. However, next week he said he would have new evidence that would blow the case wide open. Yeah. Hulk said, all right, I want you to tell me about that as soon as it arrives. 
In the meantime, I'm going in the ring. Please stay here in bodyguard Brooke. Hey, and- just by the way, the news happens to be coming next Thursday. That's when it's going to arrive. Sure. This, this news. Sure. Yes. So, uh, yes, he said, please watch my daughter. I'm going to the ring for a promo. And Joe Park Esquire proceeded to giggle and stammer. And he sat next to Brooke and Brooke inched away. And he giggled some more. Joe Park is like, he's designed to be an intelligent version of you. I'm, yeah. I'm I'm certain of this. Yeah. Yeah. Bully Ray conf- confronted Jeff Hardy backstage, dared him to put his title shot on the line. Jeff accepted. What an idiot. Yeah. Way to make the whole three-month battle you fought for irrelevant. <laughs> Hogan came out, was talking about Jeff's victory. He said Jeff was from a different universe and that he didn't always understand him. <laughs> He's not from that, this planet, he said. That makes two of us. We're not talking about like he's from the WWE universe. No, this is We're the, talking it, a, a parallel universe. In the galactic sense, yes, in, in the, the uh, meta dimensional sense. So uh he made the Jeff Hardy versus Bully Ray match official for the night. For the third I I believe it was the third time of the night it was made official. And he said he had locked the aces and eights out of the building. This was awesome. If you say so. <laughs> he explains. He explains, I locked the doors. Checkmate. <laughs> That's what he said. Yeah. I'm not even joking. Not even like check because there's windows. No, the fact that he locked the impact zone doors. Checkmate. And he took, wins against aces and eights. And it took him months to reach this conclusion. He finally figured out, Christ. These let's, doors have locks on let's them. Let's lock the damn Give me that damn key. No, all these thieves keep stealing my shit until I discovered I can lock the doors. I can lock the goddamn doors. So Aces and Aids appeared on the screen and said, did you lock us out or did you lock us in? Because and, God knows the impact zone's so big. And they all laughed Catacombs and Catacombs cackled. everywhere. The Aces and Aids have been around now for like three months. Three months. And all we know about them the way they behave, what their goals are, why they're together. All we know is that they are mean. Yes. (laughs) This is the extent of it. We know less about them than we know about Carlito. (laughs) Think about that. Yeah, Yeah, they noted that we could be anywhere because you see they're masked. And then they claim this was a checkmate. No one in this company understands chess. (laughs) No, they clearly have not, uh, not played the game. A pawn was moved on each side, yet they both considered it a checkmate. Speaking of pawns, Chavo and Hernandez had an argument. I don't believe... Dialogue. I don't believe that the dialogue Chavo Guerrero used here is the way he actually speaks in his life. I hope it is. We beat them pillar to post, he said. Yes. So... The best thing was uh, earlier we saw Angle and AJ doing this, and they were actually having a debate. Both guys wanted it. They both had confidence in each other, but they wanted to have fate in their own hands. Here, both guys agreed Chavo was the man to do it. Yeah. He's like, you are a better wrestler than me. Go to it. Oh, my. We had Daniels Daniels versus Chavo. If every match was this good, I would never complain. Daniels tried to use a belt, uh, uh, hit a belt shot. Chavo ducked. And he went on to win with, win with a frog splash. So both teams get rematches. This was a great wrestling match. Yes. I enjoyed this immensely. Between this and the main event, this this I give I give Impact a thumbs up because of those two segments. I'm still completely baffled as to what the hell's going on with I all gotta, sorts of stuff. I will but, give this show a thumbs up because there was a lot of bad stuff on the show, but it was almost all so bad it was funny. There's a lot of funny stuff on this show. That's no lie. We had a preview of next week's Gut Check Dude. His name is Evan Markopoulos, and he trained at Killer Kowalski School. Hmm. Other than that, he is an indie wrestler. I actually was upstairs during this uh, segment. Was it TJ Perkins? I don't think so. Okay. I Now watch it will be, and I'll look like an idiot. Hmm. He had black hair. Could have been. Was he skinny and ripped? I didn't really notice. I, I've Probably seen TJ Perkins, and I, I'm, I, I don't think this was TJ Perkins. Okay. I just know that uh, I think ROH sent out a press release announcing that TJ Perkins was getting a shot on Impact, so I don't know if he was a gut check guy or not. I had heard that he was 
might have had a dark match, or this might have been him. I, did TJ Perkins train with Killer Kowalski in Massachusetts? Why don't I go Isn't he from California? and find the goddamn report? All right. Find out. Go on. Tara called Brooke down to the ring, Brooke Tessmacher, congratulated her on her pay-per-view win, asked for the chance to present Brooke with a title belt. Brooke was like, uh, all right. So uh, Tara held the belt up. She put it around Brooke's waist, introduced her as the champion and her best friend, and they hugged. And she had Brooke celebrate in the ropes, and then Tara jumped her from behind. And this cowardly, diabolical attack resulted in cheers and chants of Tara's name. I loved it because you knew she was turning on her, uh-huh. but they kept teasing and not delivering, and I thought, oh, they're going to do a long... I actually wrote, they hugged, and that was it. Mm-hmm. And then, sure enough, there was a All right, this is, this is a different guy. This isn't uh, TJ Perkins. Yeah. He is uh, 18 years old, Evan uh, Markopoulos, and uh, I don't really know anything more about him. He has a MySpace, which is baffling to me. All right, go on. He's only 18? Wow. And he has a MySpace. That's the amazing part, yeah. A hysterically awful segment aired. By the way, he is very proud of his young age. Because if you you go onto his Twitter, it says uh, his name, 18 years old, 6'2", 190, 18-year-old phenom. (laughs) So he made sure to mention it twice. <laughs> he currently has 93 followers, so uh, I don't know how that bodes for his uh, his future on Impact. Go on. So Hulk's in his office. His daughter Brooke is there. Dixie. Think about this crew. D'Lo, Al Snow, and Brother Love. <laughs> That's who was in the office. So Hulk starts talking about his late brother and the bad crowd he used to hang out with. How he had to walk away. Everyone said things. I had no idea what anybody was talking about <laughs> I have about no here. idea what anyone's point was. I think, and I am not sure about this, but I think it was determined that somebody in this room must be a traitor. And as they made this uh, conclusion, the camera cut from one person, you know, like from Dixie to Brooke to D'Lo to Al, and each time it changed, there was as a, there was a dramatic drum beat. Yes, thum 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 thum. So, uh, did you write down Brooke's line? No, I'm not sure. Every, everything everyone said in the segment was quotable. It was Brooke all stupid. Said something like, <laughs> I can't even remember what she said. I just remember when D- Dixie said. There's something like, people out there have beef with all of us. They've got beef with you, Hulk. They've got beef with you, uh, 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 the hell's Pritchard's Bruce, Bruce. And as she said this, Bruce held up his hands like, who the fuck has beef with me? <laughs> yeah. The segment was horrible. Brooke said something like, uh, God damn, I wish we'd written it down. Something like, uh, um, they obviously want something. Because they keep recruiting new guys. Yes. <laughs> that, it's like, what? Uh, I, I, what I got out of this, and I only I figured this out just now. What I got out of this is that none of the talent in TNA has any idea where this angle is going either. This is an amazing segment. This, this, this what this, what this angle has been is that in June, perhaps even May, somebody said, we should do a bit where a bunch of masked guys run in. Sure. That's all they've done. That's they've the gotten, extent of it, yes. That is, no one ever got to step B. Well, step B is coming. Are you sure? What evidence do you have that there's a step B? Well, I'm sure there's a step B. Then why haven't they gotten to it they're, yet? They're taking their time, Vinny. They're, it's slow well, build. Will step B here? Will step B get here before the next Olympiad? Oh, yeah. I'm sure step B is going to take place uh, next week or at Bound for Glory. So, we had a main event, Jeff Hardy versus Bully Ray with Jeff's title shot in the line. Great match. It was much, much, much better than the pay-per-view match. Uh, it was like they knew that match sucked and wanted to do better, and they demanded a rematch. So they got it, and uh, Jeff has a new 
That was what, not really a... He's one new move, which is where he goes to the Twist of Fate, but hits a stunner instead. Then he jumps up and hits the normal Twist of Fate. And he followed that with the sent on for the clean win. And just as the rough count of three, the show ended. I actually think that it's not a new move. It's just that uh, the gimmick is he needs to hit the dude with two Twists of Fate. And so the guy has to be standing there for the second one. So he can't go all the way to his belly. So it ends up becoming a stunner. Hmm. I think they're both supposed to be Twists of Fate. Twists of Fate? Twist Twist of of Fate? Twists of Fate. They're both supposed to be Twists of Fate? I think in in the particular uh, instance here, because it's the name of the move, it'd be two twists twist of fates. I don't really care. Can we get a grammaticist on here? Technically, that's where I should be, to some degree. Well, you failed. I no, I didn't. I said twists of fate. <laughs> anyway, everybody, an excellent, excellent match this was. I thought this show was better than the pay per view. It was better than the pay-per-view. That is a fact. Yeah. Unfortunately, if you bought the pay-per-view, you saw all the rematches here tonight. Yeah. Usually not a good thing. No. But I think they realized that, uh, you know, nobody got that pay-per-view. Yeah. We got a shocking lack of feedback for that particular pay-per-view. All right, everybody. That'll do it about for today. To the back. And hard knocks she has written down here. There you go. All right, everybody. Let's uh, let's get this show on the road, Vinny. Right, what's the plan now that we're doing for the uh, impact stuff? Are we doing? Do you not want me to do segment by segment anymore? No, we're doing the whole thing. I forget. The impact. We're doing the whole thing because nobody's talked about impact. It just occurred. I see. Yes. All right. So the show opened with Shaquille O'Neal. He uh, did one segment and then was never seen again. Uh, he was backstage. He told Hulk, he told Hulk Hogan, "I have heard you've been having problems with the aces and eights." Not seen, so apparently he does not watch the show, but he heard. He vowed to have Hulk's back. He looked right into the camera and dared the aces and aces to start something. I thought something great was going to happen, and then he was never seen again. Yeah. We had... It was open fight night, so Kurt Angle and AJ Styles came down. They said, we have a title shot, co- title shot coming up. Chavo or Hernandez have a title shot coming up. Let's fight and see who's really the best. So we had the two babyface teams having a match. They took turns doing hot tags and comebacks and big spots. And matches like this only work when everyone works their ass off. And fortunately, all these men did. This was fun, fun television. Yeah, it was a great match. This is the best. I, I thought this is the best Chavo looked since he came to TNA. Well, he was working with AJ Styles and that Kurt probably Angle. probably does not hurt. <laughs> that probably helps him out. I did think it was funny that we've always seen Hernandez as the... He's always been kind of the, the X Division powerhouse guy, and he gets in there with Angle, and they're about exactly exactly the same size. Yeah. So they're having this really fun match. Uh, Chavo misses a frog splash. AJ's about to hit the Styles Clash when Kazarian and Daniels ran, run down and attack both teams with the DQ. This is well on its way to being a three-star match with any kind of finish, and if you wanted to give it one anyway, that's fine. Uh, so the champs beat up the challengers. Then Hogan comes out. Hulk Hogan made a Jay-Z reference. Weird. And then he booked the obvious three-way. He's hip, brother. I guess he is. Uh, he booked the obvious three-way for the tag titles at Bound for Glory. So Daniels and Kazarian against Angle and AJ against Chavo and Hernandez. That should be a fun match. I'll say. We had a quick promo with Al Snow. He talked about tonight's duck check candidate. He said he had not crossed the line with Joey Ryan. They showed Evan Markopoulos, who is the gut check guy doing Hindus. We saw a phone conversation with Hogan talking to Joseph. He was excited to hear that Joseph had evidence and gave him instructions on how to get through security. Keep all of this in mind, by the way, everybody. (laughs) It's just a lot to keep in mind. Why did, first off, let's start. Why did Joe Park need instructions on how to get through security if he's on the show every freaking week? For like six months. In the same building. I don't know. In fact, what was the first time we ever saw Joe Park? He just got right through security. He was talking to security. Yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, they're doing, because Bound for Glory is coming up, they're having various guys talk about their favorite Bound for Glory moments. Joe's favorite Bound for Glory memory was jumping out of a luxury box to hit Sting many levels down the staircase and landing on cement with a dropkick. I honest to God think that was kind of in some ways the beginning and the end of Joe. 
because he nearly killed himself, as he admitted, and uh, I'm not sure if he was ever the same again. If you recall, he had, like, bad back issues, and... Uh, you don't say. All of those things occurred after he went and did a flying leap and landed on his freaking back on the concrete stairs. That was an amazing stupid thing. He did not say, by the way, he's, he noted this was his... Maybe favorite mem memory is the wrong, wrong word. It just said bound for glory memories. It was his most vivid memory. Vivid memory, that's it. Yeah. I'll say. He did not say whether or not he regretted this decision. We had Evan Markopoulos talk about... I'll bet about he regrets that decision. <laughs> I, I I regret his decision, honestly. Evan Markopoulos talked about his dream of being a pro wrestler. We had an amazing segment with Dixie and Bruce Pritchard. First of all, the audio on this was way off. And I don't mean just like the words didn't match up with their speaking, but there were parts here where Dixie was talking and we heard Bruce's voice. Creepy as hell! Well, everything was off sync. Yeah, by by like six seconds. It was live, they said, but it was like, uh, it was completely, I mean, it was, literally, it was about, um, it was I don't way know, about off. six seconds, but probably about three seconds at least. It's preposterous. So, uh, the other great thing about this is, if you recall, last week their plan was, rather than lock the Aces and Nates outside, they were going to lock the Aces and Nates in. Mm -hmm. So this week, apparently the doors were locked. And uh, Dixie and Bruce were upset about being locked in. <laughs> That's their own plan they came up with. And if they've changed their mind, doesn't Dixie own the company? Can't she unlock the fucking doors? This Aces and Nate storyline, Vinny, is... Uh, Very bad. Pretty horrible, actually. It really is. We'll get into it, it more is. as we go along. It is. Shit. We had Evan Markopoulos versus Doug Williams. Evan Markopoulos is a... Uh, very skinny indie geek with some shitty gear and horrible offense who apparently is related to every single person in Orlando. He was super popular. For I have absolutely no idea why. <laughs> no reason why. No idea. I don't know if he did a promo saying that he was born here or what the deal was, but everybody, he was more over than anybody on this show. Yeah. So he began to clap like the American males. So it was, uh, it was him against Doug Williams, and for a while it was just a match, and then Doug started to beat the fuck out of him. First he hit this knee strike to the face, and then he hit this really killer knee drop also to the face, and my thought was, you know, Doug Williams is just really awesome, he may just be making this look good, and then he just kept hitting him. <laughs> he hit him a lot. He safe places. I would bet you dollars to donuts that uh, Doug Williams didn't even touch this guy. Maybe you're In right. In fact, I would actually bet you one hundred dollars that Austin Aries hit oh. Bully Ray significantly harder <laughs> than Doug Williams hit this young fella. No, I would not take that bet because I know Austin Aries wailed that's on a fact, Bully Ray. Actually. Yes, that's a fact. That's like betting that the sky is blue. So yes, uh, so e either Doug Williams is the best worker in the world, or he beat the fuck out of Young Evan, or both. Those both both could be on the table. So, uh, eventually, Evan got a very brief comeback. He tried some shitty punches, and then Doug killed him and tapped him out with a headlock. And they tried to claim it was some kind of choke, but uh, come on. This was a headlock. I just watched this match, and I think uh, I'd have to go back and look. But I think, like, two of the last three gut check matches, uh, the guys have faced Doug Williams. And after watching tonight's match... I am all for the idea of Doug Williams is the guy yes. that beats the shit out of all of the gut check guys once a month. Yes. That to me is like, that's a selling point to me. This was a great squash. This was awesome. This is one of the best squashes in years. The storyline should always be that the new guy comes in and Doug Williams comes in and just beats the crap out of him. And uh, every month you get to look forward to who is Doug Williams going to beat the crap out of this month? Yes. I'd be fine with that. That sounds awesome. This was such a great squash match. Yes. It was not Kurt Angle versus Roderick Strong. Uh, no. That will never be topped. But uh, this was the best squash match I've seen probably all year. Just I, a I'm pretty sure that's, beaten. that's safe to say. It's great. That being said, they cannot possibly give this man a contract. Well, I don't know. He's 104 pounds. If Listen, Vinny. you got to look at it the way it really is. Uh -huh. What it is is if you win gut check, 
They send you to, to Ohio, Ohio Valley, Valley to learn how to wrestle. Yeah. He's 18 years old. That's true. The fans were behind him. That's He took a great true. beating. I'd give the guy a developmental contract. I don't even know what that Can't means. Wait a minute. He took a great beating. Yeah. Doug just hit him a lot. <laughs> Listen, I've seen a lot of guys that don't even know how to sell. You could hit him with mm. a hammer and they wouldn't know how to sell. Mm. This guy at least knew how to take a beating. All right. So I'd give this guy uh, whatever their developmental deal is, you know, uh, 50 bucks a week and pay for your own uh, room board and <laughs> such. Help you get a job at Applebee's. Exactly. Yeah. So I'd, I'd be All right. down with that idea. Put it that way. So James Storm came out. He called out Bobby Roode. This was the blood feud matchup they've been building up all year. And they just fought forever. Well, no, there's, it, before we even get to that. Yes. So, uh, yeah, not even like the top of the hour, just in the middle of impact. So he calls Rude out, and, and Rude comes out, and the fans reacted to this. I can't even say it like any other impact segment. This got a below average reaction. So Rude came out in a suit. He said Storm would never be better than him. And would never be never be world champion. He refused to fight and said their issue was over and he went backstage. Announcers called him a coward. And I went off on a rant here about how when Hogan first started this thing, he said you had to fight. And I was going off about what bullshit this was. But then, lo and behold, Hulk Hogan confronted Bobby Roode backstage. He said, hey, you have three minutes to either go fight that guy or get fired. So they went to commercial. And they came back. Roode decided to not be fired and he came out to fight. Yeah. He had been wearing a suit, so he stripped to his slacks and socks with no shoes. They brawled a lot. They brawled up on the stage. They brawled down on the ramp. They brawled around ringside. They had fans putting their feet on the guardrail so Storm could throw Rude's head into them. You had a classy young lady screaming, fuck you, Rude, and daring him to hit her. <laughs> this, was, this was like a sanitized version of an old school ECW brawl. All they needed was natural-born killers playing over the sound system and a high thing to jump off of. But they had this brawl, and they were in the ring for maybe 20% of it. And finally, Storm shoved the ref, which was a DQ. And they kept brawling backstage. And I enjoyed this TV segment. I had fun watching it. But after all this, all this time, all these months, the tease retirement, the big tournament to get the title shot, the screwing in the tournament, and then the first fight is just a... Uh, a fight in the middle of impact. Mm -hmm. That's a letdown. Well, you got to remember after, uh, they did have that match in like February. I can't remember when it was, but, uh, storm had been, uh, screwed out of the title by rude. And, and all of a sudden the two of them just had a match and the top of the hour on, uh, impact. <laughs> well, actually, Brian, to prove my point, I don't remember that. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. I, I, uh, Sure took the heat off the pay-per-view match for me, whatever there was. Yeah. When they... It wasn't even like they started brawling within three seconds and got thrown out. Nope, they fought for a long time. Yeah. If you wanted to see James Storm beat up Bobby Roode, you got to see it for a long time. Yeah. And now we're supposed to pay to see it more! Yes. They I, killed this feud. They screwed the pooch. Hogan was talking to security, asking where Joseph Park was. In the middle of this, he got a phone call from the Aces and Eights. They claimed they had a lawyer, and Hogan said he knew where Park was. I get well as we found out later. We were supposed to learn. From, we were supposed to take from this conversation that Park had been kidnapped. I don't know how much longer Rude and Storm have on their contracts. I think it's a long time, but uh, just watching their feud, you know what I mean. This is like two guys, it's funny because they're being booked like two guys whose contract is up next month, where they've they've totally been, uh, they've totally both been downplayed. Bobby Roode went from like the top heel, the top star in the company to a dude who disappeared for a month and now he's back just brawling with James Storm at the top of the hour. James Storm is, is out of what was supposed to be his big crowning moment at Bound for Glory. I mean... If this were any other wrestling promotion, you would conclude that these guys are both leaving, like, really quick. But they're not. And meanwhile, Bully Ray, who was on the verge of potentially leaving really quick, they pushed him to the moon. And Jeff Hardy, whose contract is up in a few months, they're pushing him to the moon. It's astonishing. It is still TNA. I, I cannot get it. I After cannot understand what's years, going it is still on. TNA. It's still the company that gave uh, P.D. Williams the biggest push of his career after he had been fired. That's right. So, 
Uh, I had that Hogan segment. Uh, we had <laughs> a quick little deal with fans saying why they enjoyed TNA house shows, which sounds like a fine idea. One person's uh, reason they enjoyed the show is because the wrestlers hung out with them and talked to them like normal people. <laughs> As opposed to stars. Yeah. They're just normal guys. That's why they're blokes. A lot of these shows draw what an average indie draws, where everyone sells tickets to their friends. Yes, yeah. So, Aries had a meeting with Jeff Hardy backstage. The point of this was that Aries wanted to make it clear he was not the hunted; he was the hunter. He wanted everything Jeff had: the fame, the money, and the fans. And the only only way to get that was to beat Jeff and prove he could do anything Jeff could do. Uh, and the other, there's a, the, the start of the slow burn heel turn, because he's, he called Jeff's fans mindless sheep. I don't know if it was really slow burn by the end of the show. Well, no. <laughs> it's pretty clear. Speaking of heel turns, Tara came out. She claimed she had a new boyfriend, a big Hollywood star, she said. Said he was from Hollywood, and, and immediately, immediately, I presumed it was Joey Ryan. I have no other, no uh, better suggestion so she said her new boyfriend had opened her eyes and reminded her how dangerous she could be and so she's going to call out christy hemi the announcer uh apparently you can call out anyone in tna and they must show up if you want to fight like a cameraman or security y'all everyone in tna apparently signs a contract that says if called out you must fight so christy hemi came down and by the way let me talk about this open fight night I still hate the concept. Who and why? Well, can I see what happened here and then we'll get into this? All right. Because it plays into that. All right. So Christy came down. Tara started bullying her and uh, demanded. Tara demanded that Christy call Tara her favorite knockout. So Brooke Tessmacher ran down to make the save and Tara bailed. At this point, Brooke wanted to fight. And Tara walked away. So here is my question. If it's open fight night, why didn't Brooke call out Tara? And then Tara would have to fight. Because the concept sucks. Okay. The only time they ever did this right to me was when 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 the deal was the top four point getters in the tournament get to get to choose their opponents for the evening. Great. I understand. But if anybody in the entire building can call out anybody, why at the beginning of the show isn't there a mad rush to the ring I to see know. who can get the microphone first to call out the person they hate that week? You know what I mean? Or just call out the champion. Would it? Well, you can't do that, apparently, because I think you can't call out the champion. I don't even remember. But to, to me, listen, hmm. it's really easy to have a tumbler and everybody pulls out a ball and ball number one, two, three, and four get to call someone out this evening. Then at least I don't have to ask the question, why why didn't I don't know, why pick didn't, any random name. Why didn't uh why uh I don't know. Why didn't Brooke call out Tara? Why didn't Brooke call out Tara? Um why didn't uh let's just say that let's let's say that somebody got laid out. Okay, let's say that somebody called out James Storm and James Storm got laid out with a belt shot. Why couldn't uh why wouldn't Bobby Roode just come out right now and call out James Storm and then beat up his carcass? Why is that not allowed? Why why are some people allowed to call people out and others aren't? Are there people that just don't want to call people out? It is is ninety percent of the locker room just so goddamn lazy they prefer to just sit backstage and not wrestle anybody? Like, who who decides who gets to call people out? Is it first come, first serve? I mean, do you have to talk to the music guy beforehand and make sure he plays your music first? I just think the whole thing is stupid. It'd be so easy to just come up with some system where, hey, these are the guys that get to call out anyone they want. So uh, Tara went backstage. She was confronted by Brooke Hogan, who was, she explained that you can't call out an announcer after all. And she said Tara was in trouble, and she promised consequences for next week. Rob Van Dam's Bound for Glory memories were matches with Abyss and Jerry Lynn. One match he explained was one match he explained was off the charts, while the other was off the hook. And he said we had to buy pay-per-views to see a Van Terminator. They said, and this is virtually a direct quote. 
They said the TV championship would be decided next week. Yes. No mention of who the champion was or who he used to be or where he had gone. Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, there's always a possibility that Devon will be back next week. You never know. Okay. I don't think it's likely, but you never know. Fair enough. <laughs> All right. Oh, God. So we got, we're at the Hogan one. This is where, I mean, this, yeah, so we'll I've not been here. into this aces and eights, but really jumped the shark here. All right. So the last time we saw Hulk Hogan, he determined that Joe Park had been kidnapped. He did such a poor job of explaining this that I didn't realize this. I thought he just, I thought he just knew where Joe Park was. When he said that the Aces and Eights had a lawyer, I thought there was just going down the direction there would be a lawsuit. Well, I uh, when Hogan was on the phone, he said, "Oh, you've got a high price lawyer, brother." Yes. I immediately thought, "Okay, they kidnapped Joe Park. Now they're going to explain that." But they didn't. Hogan just kept talking. Yes. So I was like, okay, so I guess there is a legal team being uh, put together here by these these dastardly villains. But it turned out that, in fact, they did have Joe Park, yes. who I might add, Hogan repeatedly referred to as Joe Parks, well, because we'll even to, he doesn't know what's going we'll on. We'll get to that, too. But the point being, when Hogan, at the time Hogan came out for this promo, he thought an innocent lawyer had been kidnapped by a violent street gang. So what did he do? His music played. And he danced down he to the ring. He strutted out in slow motion. Glad hand in the he fans. posed with his bat. Grab assin. He strutted down, made it anything. Five minutes went by. And he gets in the ring, and he cuts a promo that's exactly like every Hulk Hogan promo you have heard for the past 30 years. Yes. No sense of urgency. No alarm. No concern for the safety of this lawyer. Joseph Parks. Every time he said Joseph Park's name, it got a little more wrong. <laughs> Until by the end, he was calling him Joseph Parks. <laughs> Joseph Parks. Joseph Parks. He called, in one sentence, he said the Aces and Eights were bottom feeders who always kept their word. <laughs> yeah. This segment sucked. <laughs> like going back over this, I keep finding more details about how bad this was. This is a god awful segment. So. Eventually, the bottom feeders who always keep their word appeared on the screen. And they said Park was a good detective and he had found damning evidence on their, on the, he found some damning evidence. So they destroyed his computer with a sledgehammer. Now we're missing something here. All right. Before we even got to this, there was a, Hogan was demanding they release Joe Parks. Joe, Jose Parks or whatever. Joseph. And he, he said he agreed that if, if they if they promised to uh, to let Joseph Parks go, he would go into their den That's right. next week. That's right. So apparently Ace and Eights have a secret location. And they're very concerned that Joe Park has information about who they are and where they're at. And so they're gonna let Hogan just go there. Yeah. Are they going to put him in a uh, in a in a van with with tinted windows? Uh, how are they going to transport Hulk Hogan to this den? How are they going to get him there without, for example, someone following them in the van <laughs> or using a GPS? Or using a GPS. So we go back and uh, they destroyed Joe's computer. Yeah, and Joe is in a dog run. Yes, he's locked in a chain link. Dog run, a fence, he, he a had not, box. He had not appeared in this skit. In fact, I was actually fairly certain that the man speaking originally was Joseph Parks. But no, they destroyed his computer, and there he was behind a fence. Yeah. He's in a tiny little 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 uh, two-foot-by-two-foot square box. I don't know how he fit in there. He was screaming about how they had cost him weeks of work. But never mind, it's not important, because he still had it all memorized up in his head. Yep. So then they threatened to hit him with a hammer? Not threatened. Here on national well, television... Here on national television, they walloped him with a hammer. Well, first they in the fucking head. They threatened and he pleaded for mercy, and then they hit him. Yes. So, yes, a crime. They, they hit. They assaulted a lawyer with a ball peen hammer on national television, and they cut to Hogan, who was so standing concerned. There. He's just standing there with no expression, and then he just begins to sneer. And then the show just moved on. Yep. Just to next. the back. Just next. This segment was so absolutely horrible. Much bullshit was seen here. I hate this storyline. There has to be something in it that I can believe. Or pretend to believe. 
or or enjoy. There's absolutely nothing I can even pretend to believe in this storyline. Nobody takes it seriously. I mean, the announcers are just, they move on with their lives. You know, a, a dude is locked up behind a chain link fence and he's getting hit with a hammer. And meanwhile, it's like, time to go to Austin Aries in his cape. Yep. <laughs> yep. 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 It sucks. It sucks bad. It gets worse every week. I can't wait till Hogan goes to the mystery den. Like, I can only imagine. At this point, it's like, you just got to make it complete, like, just completely They need to do one of those WCW mini-movies. Yeah. Or, or they or, try to, they send a midget to blow up Sting's limo. He needs to be, he needs to be like, uh, well, speaking of uh, of the midgets, they need to take him under the ring, and there's a secret door that leads to where these guys are at. Or he's got to step into like that uh, that 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 gimmick from Star Trek, and he gets beamed the to the secret location. Yeah, transporter. I, I see it uh, like, like like the only way to get to the Aces and Eight Secrets Clubhouse is you have to go through Vader's White Castle of Fear. Exactly. Yes. You see to go all the way with this now because it's, it's gone beyond the point of of anybody even pretending to suspend their disbelief. It's just like it's far. It's it needs long to be- gone. High on top of a snowy mountain. Yes. Or, or the bottom of the sea. Exactly. Something like this. He has to fight a shark to get in there. So, they went from the lawyer being hit in the head with a hammer live on, on camera here. They, they went to a quick video of Jeff Hardy in the woods talking about his fans. Yeah, very important. Then we had the main event. Don't worry about Joe, everybody. Don't worry about Joe. Yeah. We had Austin Aries come out. He said... Uh, Again, he wanted to prove he could do whatever Jeff could do, and since Jeff had beaten Bully Ray twice, he was calling out Bully Ray. So Ray comes out, and they do a lot of talking. Yeah, among them... Right, go ahead. Bully Ray is at ringside, and a fan touches him, and Bully Ray flips out and says, if you touch me again, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kick your ass. I'm going to punch you in the face. And uh, he says something like, you must be an Austin Aries fan, because you've got no brains. And Austin Aries, who has to be turning heel. Otherwise, he's just got no instincts whatsoever. He gets the mic and he says, well, that's not one of my fans. Because if that fan touches you again, I'll punch him in the face. And I was like, what? (laughs) What? What are you saying? He's got to be turning heel. Otherwise, he's just the most clueless baby face I've ever seen in my life. I just couldn't even believe that line. I rewound it. I was like, hold on a second. Did did he really just say that to a fan? That if you touch the heel again, I'm going to punch you? I I, I couldn't even wrap my head around it. It was just, like, astonishing to me. So then they had a match. Had a match. It was pretty good. Uh, Ray, throughout the heat, was, uh, was harassing Earl. And finally, Earl shoved him back, and then Aries started his comeback, and Earl got bumped. So Aries hit the last chancery, but there was no ref. Bubba tapped. Bubba tapped, and there was no ref. Aries was pissed, so Aries went for his dropkick in the corner, but Ray got his chain. He clonked Aries in midair, and he covered him, and the ref revived, and the ref counted three. Yeah. And Bully Ray pinned the world champion, Austin Aries. Mm-hmm. And yes, uh, as I noted in my notes here, if he's not turning here, turning heel... That's just really weird. He well, has, and they had the big argument with Jeff Hardy afterwards. You know, well, that yeah, yeah. By it's yeah. By the end of this, it's clear he's very he's very much turning heel. He may still beat Bully Ray next week or something, but he's turning heel. I liked how absolutely underwhelmed the announcers were when the world heavyweight champion was pinned in the middle of the ring. Yeah, they were like his shoulders are down. One, two, three. Bubba Bully Ray gets the win. And I actually gave it a hell of a lot more uh, enthusiasm than they did. And I was like, dude, your world heavyweight champion just got pinned in the middle of the ring. <laughs> That's a big deal! <sighs> yeah. It also completely throws everything in a disarray. This Bound for Glory booking is just like, it's all off the rails right now. Talk about muddying the waters. Is it a three-way now? Is it Bully Ray, Austin Aries, and, and Jeff Hardy? God, it might be. Maybe it is. I don't know. Let's just you know. Let's just go like completely off the rails. Let, let, let's uh, let's take the train into the the ocean while we're at it, where Hulk Hogan is going to be searching for the aces and eights. This was not a good show, everybody. 
Yeah, Some good so, wrestling on the show. Just to finish it up here, yeah, Ray, Ray won. He was going to hit Aries with the title belt, but Jeff made the save. But then Jeff held the belt and admired it, and Aries yanked it away, and they screamed at each other. Yeah. That's just for completeness. I thought we should include that. Ay, 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 ay. All right, everybody. That's the show for today. To the back! Yes. Well, in the meantime, should we talk about Impact? Let's talk about Impact. Bad show. <laughs> not a terrible show, not a horrible show, but it was not a good show. Hulk Hogan came to the ring. He said the TV title was vacant. He was bummed that Devon was gone. That was business. And yes, he actually used the name Devon. I do love this whole Devon thing where, like, Hogan wants him back, apparently in real life, or he's just trying to make his Twitter followers happy. Because he keeps talking on Twitter about how, oh, this is so horrible. We'll get him back, brother. And now he goes on live national television and talks about how he doesn't want Devon to be gone and how he likes Devon and how he wishes Devon could be there. And meanwhile, Devon is gone. Yeah. You know what I mean? What does that say about TNA where you're announcing on national television that we can't afford Devon? Yeah. It's preposterous. Yeah. Or Hogan himself. Like... I know that Hogan has had a lot of problems in his life, but he's Hulk Hogan. The idea is supposed to be that he's a he's a crazy rich guy. Why doesn't he hire Devon if he likes him so much? This is wacky. That's actually a good point. He booked James Storm versus Bobby Roode for the pay-per-view in a street fight with a special enforcer who makes bones snap, crackle, and pop. King Mo. King Mo. Special guest referee. Yeah. That's better than wrestler. Yes. At this point. He was being uh, extra hulky tonight. All kinds of sound effects. He spat before he mentioned the aces and eights. Uh, he said he was going to their clubhouse tonight. Out came Sting, who said he was tagging along. We had Mr. Anderson's top Bound for Glory memory. He had a main event against Kurt Angle in 2010. I have no memory of this memory. <laughs> yeah. We had a three-way. The three-way tag match of the pay-per-view to build to that, they had the three-way singles match here of Kurt Angle versus Chavo versus Christopher Daniels. This is weird. Kurt and Chavo were constantly getting along and then bickering like they were the heels. And then they uh, finally started fighting. And then Daniels hit Chavo with that one judo move that he uses all the time and never beats anyone. And this time it won. I know why you don't remember this. What? The, the Anderson? Mr. Anderson thing. All right. Uh, Bound for Glory 2010. Uh, there was a lethal lockdown match on it with EV 2.0. Remember them? The ECW guys? Yes. Okay. Against Fortune. There was also a Sting, Kevin Nash, and D'Angelo De Niro against Samoa Joe and Jeff Jarrett in a two-on-three handicap match that appears to be advantage baby faces, but I'm not sure. Rob Van Dam beat Abyss. Jay Lethal beat Doug Williams. Ink Inc. beat Orlando Jordan and Eric Young. Motor City Machine Guns beat Generation Me. Tara beat Angelina Love, Velvet, and Madison. So that feud's been going on forever. Anyway, main event. It was a three-way. Jeff Hardy, Kurt Angle, and Mr. Anderson. So even Mr. Anderson mis misremembered his favorite memory. Yes. All right. Yes. Which, by the way, he did not win that match. So Hogan had the four TV title contenders in his office. When he announced this in the opening, I thought it was going to be a tournament. And then here everyone's arguing for a shot. And I thought by the end he was just going to pick a winner uh, by whoever won the debate. And what eventually happened was... So the champion would be the debate winner? That's what I thought was going to happen. Huh. But, well, it's close to what happened because the two guys who won the debate got to wrestle the match. Yes. So, so two of the men were eliminated due to poor verbal skills. Well, that's how they do it every week on Championship Thursday. Uh, it's stupid. <laughs> You're not a fan of getting a title shot via debate? I am not in any way. It sucks. It would suck if, for example, you were it was me and Todd Martin in the room because that guy would never get a title shot. So throughout this segment, they mentioned Devon, Devon's name over and over and over again. Everyone here had a lousy argument. Anderson said he was tired of talking. He just wanted to fight somebody. Yay! Hulk asked who he wanted to fight. Anderson picked Garrett. <laughs> Wise man. Hogan eliminated Magnus. I don't know why. 
He didn't have a good reason. This uh, was stupid. Think about this, by the way. Even less sense than usual. When when you keep mentioning Devon, so apparently they could not even afford to bring in Devon for one day. Yeah, they couldn't. They couldn't bring him in and drop the title. Yeah, astonishing. Brooke Hogan met with Tara. Tara repeatedly pulled out her boy pulled out her phone to talk to her boyfriend. She mentioned hanging out with Stacy and George. And finally, Brooke snatched the phone, said Tara had a match coming up, and she left with the phone. I don't know if I should like blame Theft. the writers or the performers, but the verbiage these girls spew, including the baby faces, it makes them all so completely unlikable. Like, Brooke Hogan was so hilariously unendearing. Unendearing? So unlikable in this here segment. She sucked. And she was supposed to be like the the strong baby face sticking it to the heel. And when it was over, I was waiting for Tar to just go kick her ass. We had a uh, Tara versus ODB. This wasn't bad. Vinny. All right. TNA women matches. Come on. She just had a lot of good women matches. This was not bad. It was it was fine until the finish. Well, that part was lame. Tara took this wonky fall out of the ring, started settling her knee. Match, it was good up until this point, but this it fell apart. Ground to a total halt. Uh, Tara took off her knee brace. Started selling in the ring. Turin Terrell didn't know what to do. Just looked at her. Titney? Her tits were in fine display this evening. And and there's that's her, uh, well, best asset, for lack of a better term. There's her tits. So, uh, yeah, Titney. Uh, ODB was yelling at Eric. Nothing happened for several minutes. ODB got back to the ring and asked Tara, quote, Are you seriously hurt? Are you hurt for real? And then Tara rolled her up and won. The only redeeming quality to this is that Tara, in the roll-up, managed to get her own foot on the ropes. So good for her. I do love in uh, in pro wrestling. I, I, I'm I'm not going to... I mean, it doesn't bother me. I just think it's kind of funny. Because, I mean, if, if this bothers me, then everything should bother me in wrestling. But I love when someone, like, hurts their ankle and takes off their boot. It's like... You do realize the boot is there to secure the ankle, to keep it stable. At least in that case. If you hurt your ankle, you should tighten your boot, not take the goddamn thing off. I I, I can, uh, perhaps the ankle's starting to swell. Sure. And you need to take the boot off so... so But still, pressure, you know? Tara took off a brace. Yeah, her knee got hurt, and so (laughs) her knee was so badly injured that she took off her knee brace. (laughs) Yes. I was like, how is this selling that your knee is hurt? What you should do is screw that thing on tighter now. But no, she took it off and then rolled her up for the pin. And then she started jumping around and rolling outside. And I was like, don't blow your knee out for real because you just took off your legit uh, knee brace right yes. there. But yes. She was fine. We had Brother Love chewing out Al Snow for punching Joey Ryan. A month ago. At least a month ago, it seems. Bully Ray was in a tag match tonight against Hardy and uh, Aries. And he did a little promo saying he was not going to reveal his partner. Hogan met with the three remaining TV title contenders and eliminated Garrett Bischoff. So it was down to Joe and Anderson, Joe and Anderson in the finals of a really shitty tournament. <laughs> they made sure to zoom in on Garrett's face, and he was very upset. So we may be having a Garrett Bischoff turn here soon. Because God knows well, <laughs> well, we need our top heels named Bischoff. It was, I was to say, it is Eric Bischoff's son. Yes. Just on that note, he's already unlikable. We had a weird segment. Rude approached Aries in the dressing room. He revealed himself as Bully Ray's tag team partner, so that cat's out of the bag. He said that he could not get another title shot as long as Aries was champion. Which begs the question why he screwed James Storm at the pay-per-view. It does. It really, really... Well, that wouldn't matter because it would still be Aries' champion regardless. He didn't, he, if he had screwed Aries' opponent, that would matter. He should be happy whoever beats Aries, whether that is James exactly. Ford or Jeff Hardy. Exactly. All right. So, 
Uh, he said that Aries had beaten him a lot, but Aries had never beaten Jeff. And this went on for a while, and he left. And Aries said, I have no idea what that was about. And I thought to myself, I don't either. We had Samoa Joe versus Mr. Anderson. I know you like this finish. I like the finish. I thought the match... The match was poor. It was all right. I mean, there was some... Anderson tried to throw Joe around, but Joe was fat, and Anderson struggled a lot. Then it looked like Anderson forgot spots. Then it looked like he got blown up. Besides that, it was great. (laughs) Anderson is not a very good grappler. No. (laughs) And uh, the finish was he got put in a choke, and uh, I don't know. I kind of liked it because he, like, fought and fought and fought, got pulled back, fought and fought, fought got pulled back, and finally went to sleep. But there's also that part of me that... Yeah, it's like, it, it, was it took phony. you two minutes to choke this guy out, Joe, for Christ's sake. It seemed much longer than two minutes. It wasn't that long. It was, he, he, he laid there and laid there and laid there, and Anderson reached for the ropes and got pulled back, and he laid there and laid there and laid there, and he reached for the ropes and got pulled back, and then he just napped. It, it like, I liked it. Here's what I liked about it, Vinny. The match wasn't very good. The finish was, as noted, you should be able to finish a guy with a choke in a little faster than, like, two minutes or one minute or whatever it actually was. But uh, it was a TV title match, and I like the fact that one guy beat the crap out of the other guy and beat him decisively and is now the champion. I can never complain too much about that. That happened. We could have had run-ins. We could have had belt shots. We could have had this. We could have had that. No, one guy beat the other guy clean, decisively, and now he holds the belt. So great. I understand that. It is a sad, sad state of affairs that you have to mention this is a good thing. <laughs> this is the anomaly. Yeah. Uh, where are we here? Uh, Hogan and Sting were discussing their battle plan. A random woman with a clipboard walked up and said Hogan had some paperwork he needed to sign. Then she maced them, and the aces and eights appeared and threw them into a van and drove away. Yeah. Now, let's ponder this, right? <laughs> The owner of the company, or uh, whatever his role is, general manager, I guess. Yeah, sure. The Dixie's still around, too. The guy in charge, and the only person he can rely on, the, his, his fighting champion, I suppose, is his best friend and only ally. They are both overwhelmed and kidnapped by a violent gang of street thugs who have spent seemingly all year invading this company and uh, injuring men left and right. Pope still has not returned. They've kidnapped a guy last week and hit him with a hammer on TV. So here this this abduction occurs. And when they come back from break, no one mentions it. Time to move on with the show. Yeah, it's time for a gut check. Was that next? So it was that was next. It's very important to see if this 18 year old gets a contract. It was Hogan and Stink could take care of themselves after being maced and blindfolded and shoved into a van and Abducted. Yeah. Okay. I, I thought for a second that there may have been a comment about this, but that, that actually came later in the show, and it gets worse. So it was time for gut check. The highlight of this segment, the highlight of the entire show, was Al Snow's jacket. I Something else. Can't describe it except to say it was shiny and brown. It had some wacky pattern on it. So the gut check. It was Evan. Uh, I believe Markopolis was his last name. So uh, he shaved his pits. That's a plus. Taz voted yes. Brother Love voted no. Evan then got to cut a promo, and he turned to Al Snow, who was the only judge remaining. He mentioned Al's history of trying so hard, as hard as he could, to get to get a break in ECW or Smoky Mountain. But Al was not even was uh, much older than eighteen at the time. Now here's Evan trying to get in a TN eighteen, and all he needs to make his own dream come true is for Al to say yes. This is a hell of a promo. He cut a hell of a promo. It was logical. It made sense. It and it was delivered with uh, with great passion and and, and speaking ability. Which he I cut such a great have. promo that uh, that Al like smiled and looked at Bruce and Bruce nodded and I thought for sure Bruce was just like all right say yes, but instead Al cut this promo about how how great Evan was. How much heart and passion he had. How he had so much upside. But no. I believe he said you have everything necessary to be a star. Yeah, he said you're everything this gut check is about. Or maybe that's uh, Pritchard. Somebody said that. But anyway, the point is they said no to him. And, uh, eh. I mean, 
It is what it is. It, he may be signed anyway. Yeah. But uh, I would have signed the guy after that promo. It was a great promo. I mean, all you do is go to developmental and wrestle the mobile homers and get better. So mm. what, what's the what's the downside? You know? And he uh, accepted this like a man. He shook their hands and he left. Yeah. So, Tanay then announced that footage had been delivered to the production truck. That was quick. Keep in mind, in 10 minutes, the Aces and Eights kidnapped Hogan and Sting, drove them away, filmed a segment, and brought the film back. Yeah. Well, it is digital nowadays. They didn't have to take Perhaps it to a Perhaps they may have photo. emailed it. Yeah. Put it on a thumb drive. So the first shot we got was just Hogan and Sting being put at a table and tied to chairs, and the hoods were yanked off their heads. And Hogan looked around the room and had even less of a clue as to what was going on than he does in most days of his life. He's trying to explain angles. <laughs> trying to explain that it's Joseph Park, Hulk. Park. So, we then had a long segment where it was Hogan and Sting talking to the boss of the Aces and Eights, who kept his back to them the entire time. And was wearing a cap backwards, so I immediately presumed it's Bully Ray. But supposedly he's at the building. Mm-hmm. Not that any of this matters. The uh, Hulk wanted to know where Parks was. He's the fat guy over there, tied to a table, groaning. Hulk, yeah. you know it's one of the. I, there's uh This happens sometimes where some guys just can't help themselves from putting an S at the end of someone's name. Yeah, Dan Adams. Dan Adams. Phil Sims is a football commentator who always refers to Asante Samuel as Asante Samuels. Keith Brookings has been playing football for like 18 years. People still call him Keith Brookings. Don Owens. Don Owens. Here's Joe Parks. So. You want to know why? Yes. Because sometimes the name sounds better if you add the S. Our buddy Dan Adam. I can't wrap my head around the name Dan Adam. It's got to be Dan Adams. You know what I mean? (laughs) When I'm president. Dan will have to change his name. He's going to have to change his name to Dan (laughs) Adams. platform. Yeah. That'll be my whole speech. Hey, hey, you know what? I heard worse. And I'm president. Everyone's going to spell their name the same way. So, uh, yeah, they wanted to know where Parks was. They wheeled Park in, bound and gagged. He said, mm. the, Excuse me? That's what he said. Yeah. The uh, boss had a plan. He wanted a tag match at the pay-per-view with Hogan's team versus his team. If Hogan's team won, he would disappear forever. The game would disappear forever. If his team won, they would get, quote, full access. Yeah, because you're missing the best goddamn part of this idiocy. All right. The big boss is explaining that everything was going great till you put one over on us. You locked the doors. (laughs) It's like, what? That's still the storyline? That you were running roughshod until they ingeniously locked the doors? Yes. Isn't the gimmick that you could be anybody? Couldn't you all have just put your goddamn outfits in a bag and went in as fans and then put your outfit on? That is the part of me that, like, the storyline is, like, so idiotic because of that locking door gimmick. Like, we can't get into the building because you locked the doors. It's like, there's no other doors. There's nobody to let you in. You know, there's no way in, no way out. Once, once the impact taping starts, what? What if I got to pee really bad? What if I have a, uh, you know, what if I I fall down and hurt my leg? I'm locked in there. It's ridiculous. Just ridiculous. That's not what I hated about this. Not uh, that's not what I hated most. Uh, they added, by the way, the stipulation: Hogan cannot be on his own team. Yes. And their explanation for Thank this. Thank God. The explanation for this was not that you are old and can't move. No, the explanation was, I want you to watch as your team yeah. loses. But uh, they also explained, this is what I hated, that just to make sure they knew Hogan was into playing mind games and whatever, chess games, I think they said, but to uh, hold him to his word, they were going to keep Joe Park until after the pay-per-view. Yeah. They kidnapped this lawyer a week ago. And a pay-per-view is not for several more weeks. Yeah, they're just going to hold on to They're going to hold a captive for weeks, and no one's going to call the legal authorities. Hopefully they got a good menu wherever they're at, because he's a heavy guy. He needs to eat. Apparently. 
They went back to the impact zone, and Mike Tanay referred to this as, quote, a unique situation. <laughs> well, he was right. The more I think about this, this show sucked. Storm cut him backstage promo, hyping up his street fight with Rude. He said King Mo would only be there to raise his hand. We had Robert Rude and Bully Ray versus Jeff Hardy and Austin Aries in the main event. Crowd chanted, Devon's better. By the end of this, I determined that Devon was the second biggest star in the company behind Hulk Hogan. Yeah. He's not there. <laughs> and, and it won't be there. Just hanging out. So the gimmick here was they got the heat on Aries, but then when he had a chance to make a hot tag, he opted to prove he could do what Jeff couldn't and stay in and make his own comeback. Made a hell of a comeback. It was great. He hit Rude with the Brain Buster, but then Hardy blind tagged himself in and he had a senton on Rude for the win, for the win, and then Aries and Hardy bickered as the show went off the air. And the only positive I got out of all this is that this felt like the first show since like March, where the Aces and Eights were not the focus of the last segment. Well, that's true; they weren't, but they're going to be the focus of many segments over yep. the next three weeks, yep. getting into Bound for Glory. Not a fan of this show. No, nah, mm, nah. Mm-mm. It's better than it was last year at this time. I'm sure that's true. We should check. Oh, I'm positive, because it was last year's Bound for Glory tournament was wrapping up. The one oh, where God. Joe had minus 10 points, and nobody knew what was going on, and now everybody buries it a year later in the company. That's right, yes. It was much It was much worse a year ago. But it was much better about uh, four months ago, and it has since taken a backward step for whatever reason. All right, everybody, we are going to uh, wrap it up here today.